Welcome everybody to the HGH Church podcast. My name is Toby. I'm the curate here, if you don't know me, uh, based at Holy Trinity Church in Hastings. And today uh, we're going to be having a bit of a conversation around Colossians, which is the series we've been looking at on Sundays. And I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, one Jason Myers, who is coming all the way from across the pond uh, in the States. Jason, welcome to the HGH Church podcast. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for um, giving up your time today to come and talk to us about this. You're now, welcome. Jason, I wonder if we, we could start, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Why, why have I got you, of all people, uh, here? What, what do you do? Who are you? What are you about? And how did you end up doing what you do as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as you mentioned, my name's uh, Dr. Jason Myers, and I am currently based in North Carolina, where I teach biblical studies uh, as an associate professor of religion. Uh, at Greensboro College. Uh, we came in contact through a mutual friend because I also teach at uh, WTC Theology uh, in Nottingham. Um, and so I come over twice a year to teach biblical studies uh, classes for, for them. And so we've kind of connected through our friend Becky, and she has put us in, in touch. Um, so I am currently working on a Colossians commentary uh, for a new series called Proclamation, Preaching the New Testament, which is aimed at um, how we preach these texts um, in our in our church settings. And so I'm busy at work. I think I've made it through chapter one. Um, and I love studying uh, the Apostle Paul. That's what I did my uh, PhD in. And so I've been studying Paul for the last, I guess, 15 years or so. Um, math can be hard sometimes. Um, but I uh, love the Apostle Paul because I find him to be such an interesting figure, uh, sometimes uh, infamous uh, at best. Uh, but I think he has, you know, a unique placement um, for our, our day and age and how he um, conceives of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and how he works in settings where uh, persons have come to know the story of the gospel uh, from no kind of uh, theological background. So I find him to be a great aid uh, in that. You mentioned a little bit about Paul there, why he's significant uh, for you. And why should we? Why do you think he's important to us today? Though? Why why should we pay attention to someone who's writing these letters two thousand years ago? Uh, not and also this is the thing I love about Paul. Anyway, myself is just that he was writing these letters with no idea that two thousand years later we'd be sat down having a conversation about something that he wrote. So why why do we do that? Why why are we paying attention to him? Yeah, I think I think you're right. You know, I think we should never miss uh, the big surprise here that we are studying letters from from 2,000 years ago. Um, that might strike Paul as uh, interesting to say the least. Um, but I think you know he is someone for uh, yeah the moment that we find ourselves in. Uh, as I mentioned a, a little bit ago, right? He primarily works with Gentiles, uh, persons who do not have. Uh, a Jewish background. Um, they have not been reading the Old Testament or the Ten Commandments. Uh, they don't know about the prophets. Uh, and I really see Paul as kind of a cross-cultural communicator. Uh, in a way, that's what he's doing. He's taking uh, this very Jewish message about Israel's God, about Yahweh, uh, and kind of translating it into a key uh, that non-Jewish people can can understand. And I think this is partially related to, to who he is as a person. Uh, if you remember, Paul grew up in the city of Tarsus, uh, which is located in modern-day Turkey. Uh, and so he kind of stands with kind of one foot in that Gentile world, uh, but of course is raised uh, as a Jewish person, uh, training to be a Pharisee, so a foot in a very different world. Uh, and I think from the moment he began to put concepts together uh, as a young uh, kind of lad, you know, I think he was beginning to do this kind of translation work of how does this story about Israel's God make sense in a world that looks so radically different from his own? Um, you know, if you're involved in ministry or just uh, life in this world, you probably have found yourself at that intersection before. Uh, how do these stories about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, about Jesus and the disciples, about uh, Paul and these communities, how do they make sense? Uh, in a world that looks so radically different from our own. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from Paul uh, about how to do that and about how this message really does um, transform uh, our world that we see ourselves in. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, I think it was, um, uh, is it Willie James Jennings who talks about um, uh, the, the, the reminder that we today are all Gentiles, you know, yeah. and we're, we're so far removed from that. So Paul is a really yeah. helpful conversation partner for us. Yeah. 
like we feel, can feel so far removed from the Judaism of Paul's day and yes. the Judaism today and all those kind of things. So he's he's great to be in dialogue with. Exactly. Um, you mentioned that you're uh, you've, you've you've embarked on this uh, commentary on uh, the study of Colossians. Uh, why why Colossians? Out of all the 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 books. I mean, most people would maybe go for Romans or Galatians, but you go for Colossians. What what is it that you that you love about it? Maybe. So yeah, I I am also a co-editor of the series, and so we gave away um, Romans and Galatians to maybe some of the the more higher ups, the more senior level uh, <laughs> persons. I am still relatively young, um, and so I, I took up Colossians. It's actually been a, a favorite letter of mine for a long time. Uh, kind of in personal backstory, one of the first classes I ever took in biblical studies was on Colossians. Um, and so in many ways, it is it is rather fitting um, that uh, the first time I embarked on a study of Paul was in Colossians and Philemon. Um, and now uh, here I am uh, writing a commentary. So there's a kind of a, a niceness uh, mm. to that that I'm, I'm really, really happy to. Uh, I think Colossians is important uh, in a way that I've termed somewhat... Um, creatively as a theology for the valley. Uh, and I mean this in a couple of different ways. Of course, Paul is currently writing from, from prison. Uh, he is imprisoned um, because of his testimony uh, about Jesus being Lord. Uh, so he finds himself in that kind of uh, metaphorical uh, valley. Uh, Colossae, the city itself, is actually located literally uh, in the Lycus Valley, which is, in again, in modern-day Turkey. Um, and so literally they find themselves uh, located in that not just in a literal sense, but also, I think, in a figurative sense. Uh, as you read through the letter, right, Paul is encouraging them, challenging them, uh, as they are kind of beset and maybe beleaguered uh, by a few other issues going around in their day. And so I think Paul writes this as a theology for the valley to kind of lift their eyes, uh, in many ways, from where they're at uh, to this vision uh, that you see in chapter one of this kind of cosmic Christ, of the Christ that rules and sustains all, uh, who has been there since creation um, and has, you know, called them into a uh, relationship with himself. And so I think it's this, really this theology for the valley. Mm. That's good. He lifts their eyes. That's great. That's really helpful. And so uh, what was the kind of particular occasion? Why Why was Paul writing to this community of people uh, and what was what were some of the perhaps the issues they were facing what were some of the things they were looking down on that they needed to lift their eyes to this like you said this kind of image of the cosmic christ that we read about in colossians 1 yeah this is one of those points in scholarship um we say this all the time where there's disagreement (laughs) there's a variety of opinions which is not hard to find when you come across studying scripture uh but Mm. it is actually rather challenging because when we study paul's letters Right, we have kind of one side of that telephone call or that cell phone call, and so sometimes we try to piece together maybe what's happening uh, in a particular location. One of the things that makes it challenging with Colossae is that Paul uh, didn't start this church. Uh, we realize from the letter uh, that Epaphras, uh, who's mentioned there in chapter one and chapter four, uh, he's Paul's coworker and he's kind of integral uh, to these communities that are in this valley. There's kind of a um, triad of cities uh, that are, are kind of growing up together. And so when we read through the letter, we try to find places where it may give uh, evidence of what's been going on. And one of those pieces is what I've already mentioned, chapter one. There's something about this hymn that seems to be related to some of the problems uh, in the letter. Um, and so we get this kind of cosmic vision. Uh, but as we read through the letter, a couple of different issues have been put forward. Um, some see it just as pagan religion. So again, as I mentioned, all these Gentiles kind of come out of uh, non-Jewish uh, ways of life. And so it may be related just to pagan conceptions of God. Uh, some have looked at philosophy. Some have looked at issues uh, dealing with Judaism, maybe a little bit like Galatians. Uh, and then some say it might be a, a kind of collection or constellation of issues that have prompted Paul to write. Uh, as you read through the letter, um, I kind of um, orient your listeners to a couple different sections. So in chapter two, we get this big discussion in, in verse eight, where Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy or elemental spiritual forces. Uh, mm. And in verse 16, there's this idea of eating and drinking and festivals and Sabbaths. And then in verse 20, through 21 of chapter 2, we get these spiritual forces again about do not handle 
do not taste, do not touch. And so it appears to be some sort of combination, I think, of a variety of issues confronting this this church uh, that Paul has to kind of remind them uh, of of these realities. Mm. Could you go? Could you just speak a little bit more about so those different things? Colossians two eight eighteen and twenty to twenty one. It's quite hard to understand what Paul is really getting at with those things. Uh, can you can you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, those elements, what makes it difficult is that we can't all put them kind of in one box. So right. again, the, the idea of Sabbath day. Okay, well, Sabbath is um, uh, observed right by uh, people uh, involved in Judaism. So we go, okay, it must be a, a Jewish related issue. But then we get issues of like um, new moons, deceptive philosophies, um, things like that. And we go, well, maybe this is related to um, some sort of philosophical tradition. Um, and we do know a lot of different groups, um, even Jewish groups like Philo down in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, that attempted to engage with various forms of philosophy in the first century. And so uh, it appears to, I think, be some sort of amalgamation of, mm. of various factions where the Colossians have uh, kind of slipped back into um, different ways of life. And Paul's kind of calling them, again, out of that valley uh, in a mm. way. Uh, to uh, this kind of freedom in Christ, uh, to the importance of Christ. Um, and again, we get this issue of eating and drinking, which comes up a lot in, in Paul's letters, whether you're in um, Romans 12 through 15, 1 Corinthians. Uh, and so it seems to be issues that kind of beset um, new uh, congregants, uh, new people who came to know Jesus, uh, and highly related to those kind of past um, uh, avenues of, of their life. And those things are, are issues because they they fracture the community in some way. Is that is that am I right with that? Yeah, there appears to be some sort of division here um, within the community where they are, yeah, maybe seeking to separate from one another, which we see a lot in, in some of uh, Paul's mm. other letters. Um, and that's what we do as scholars is we try to kind of you know uh, look at the region, look at Paul's other letters, and see if there's um, again Paul may just have known about the region. It's not terribly far from Galatia. Um, and so it may have been kind of in that orbit. And so as he writes, uh, he kind of writes in that vein. Um, I believe it was Michael Bird who said, uh, Colossians is like if Galatians and Ephesians had a baby. Um, <laughs> and so it's this kind of uh, interesting, you know, um, uh, creative letter here that, ha that has touchstones with Galatians, but then a few with uh, Ephesians as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you, and you touched on it a little bit uh, just now, but the the solution to the issues that the Colossians are facing, these things that are that are, are breaking the, or wanting them to separate in some way, Paul's solution is uh, quite simple: is Jesus. But mm -hmm. I guess Colossians, you mentioned the um, the hymn, uh, which is mm -hmm. the reference to the bit in, in chapter one where you get all this beautiful poetic imagery. Can you can you unpack that a little bit more? Paul's solution there to these these issues. Yeah, so we get this hymn in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, which many scholars have, you know, over the um, centuries wondered if Paul is adapting maybe a song that the Colossians were used to to singing, kind of a preformed hymn. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, probably added his own elements. But uh, either way, as the letter, as it stands in chapter one, right, um, it's this really kind of cosmic vision of Christ as both creator uh, and reconciler. Um, and so we see this, um, again, glorious sin that we perhaps even have memorized, where Christ is active in creating the world. He's uh, the first act of also new creation, right? So resurrection, this kind of um, recreation, uh, Christ stands at the head of, of that as well. Um, and as both creator and new creation, right, uh, Christ is also reconciling, Paul says, all things uh, to himself. Um, and so that all things language, I think, you know, uh, asserts in some ways, maybe subverts all the other ways that the Colossians are kind of caught up um, in these um, traditions uh, about eating and drinking and celebrating uh, Sabbaths. I'd say that all things kind of find their completion um, um, in Christ and that being reconciled to him uh, gives them that fullness of life that perhaps they're they're searching for. Uh, when we talk about reconciliation, of course, it's easy maybe for some of us to talk about uh, reconciliation to God, uh, that God uh, reconciles us to himself through Christ. 
But one of the interesting things in Colossians is that it's also aimed at the reconciliation uh, of the community uh, amongst itself. So uh, Paul says, if you're reconciled to Christ, uh, we are reconciled to one another. Uh, this human mm-hmm. reconciliation uh, is part of that entire package uh, that, that, that Christ is doing. So, am I right in thinking? So, it's a, if if um, you know Jesus is the Creator, the one who kind of encompasses all things in some ways, or is in all things, like Paul talks about, then that means that we're all kind of headed roughly towards the same goal. So, the things that are separating us don't need to, because everything is finding its its home, uh, its goal in, in Jesus. Yeah, that's that's his main point. That is, it, as kind of harbingers of the new creation. Uh, these communities that Paul is uh, helping launch, develop, sustain, right? They become these kind of outposts uh, of the kingdom. And so that reconciliation, Mm -hmm. although we tend to think of that sometimes as a future element, right? That God will reconcile all things someday in the future. uh, The early Christians, right, believe that that had started now. Uh, and that they could uh, have a foretaste of that in the present. And so that actually is what makes our worship together each week actually rather um, surprising uh, and rather important Mm. is that we become this kind of foretaste of what the world will one day uh, be. And so as we think about reconciliation, our relationships with one another um, are are of utmost importance because they become a sign uh, for the world Uh, of how human relationships will one day be. Uh, So rather than being kind of racked with division and angst and maybe um, animosity towards one another, uh, they become relationships of peace, forgiveness, um, and and unity uh, as a sign of that ultimate uh, restoration. Mm, That seems like a a, a very uh, high calling for, for the church. And I wonder, obviously the church today is facing a lot of, um, issues and, and divisions and things like that. What would you say is the kind of key message for us contemporary readers of Paul and particularly contemporary readers of Colossians? Like what, what can, what can we, uh, take away as the key message? Yeah, I think, uh, one of the, obviously we have a lot of challenges facing us, uh, today, uh, as a church, both, uh, here in the States and of course, uh, in the UK and in Europe. Uh, but, you know, I think that's one of the places, if we understand uh, Paul's kind of theology of the Spirit, is that the Spirit is uh, the game changer. It is the sign that God has, um, one, said yes to his promises. Uh, this is the Spirit that was promised by by Joel and the prophets. Uh, and so we can experience that now. Um, and it's a, it's a creative act of power, right? So the Spirit, um, that third person of the Trinity, is what raises Christ from the dead. Uh, and so I think, you know, as we look around at our world and at issues that kind of beset the church, um, and oftentimes we can get discouraged, um, we have the same power at work, both in us, that not only raised Christ from the dead, but also empowered uh, the early church. And if Paul teaches us anything, uh, it's that God's power, how, however we think of that, uh, is displayed in weakness. And so I think as we look at our challenges, they really are opportunities uh, for a great work of God, where um, to quote a friend, right? Um, unless God sustain it, sustains it, uh, it'll fail. Um, and so I think you know, mm-hmm. as we look at these things that kind of beset the church, uh, we can rest in the fact uh, of of Paul's vision of of Christ that He is seated uh, at the right hand of the Father, and He is actively reconciling uh, kind of all things to Himself, and that ought to be, uh, I think, a message of hope, um, mm-hmm. especially in a world where it's so easy to get discouraged. That certainly gives me hope. And it sounds like a, a, you find a, you you find hope and comfort in that as well. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And it doesn't, uh, you know, I think, uh, relieve us of the hard work that has to be done, uh, kind of mm. on the ground. Uh, but knowing that we are not, I think, you know, charting new territory, but rather the Spirit goes ahead of us, kind of breaking mm. that ground. And we are really, as we see in the book of Acts, just trying to keep up uh, with the work that the Spirit is doing. Um, and I think mm-hmm. that that, uh, as others have mentioned, is what we call the discipline of hope, uh, is that we mm-hmm. constantly remind ourselves uh, week in and week out, both in worship and at the table, uh, that this is kind of the true uh, reality that kind of um, resets uh, all things. And so I think as we, we see God's work, that God has not abandoned 
um, his creation. I think well, that's one of the other, other other elements we see in Colossians is that when we think about God's reconciliation, it's us and God, us and one another, but it's also us and the world, both the physical uh, world um, and that we are kind of all in this together, uh, as it were, um, in God's great act of reconciliation. I love that. A discipline of hope. Uh, that's, that's really good. Hey, Jason, yeah. I want to thank you so much for um, giving up a small chunk of your time today and chatting through some of these You're most welcome. things. Uh, when, when are you hoping to have the commentary done by? Is this, is this going to be a few years worth of work or, or you know? That is the great question. Uh, yeah, hopefully in the next uh, year or two, we'll have it wrapped up. It's supposed to be a shorter one, as most commentaries at least start out, but they tend to grow. Um, so yeah, hopefully in the next couple of years, it'll be out and uh, it'll be available for others to read and hopefully learn and grow from. Excellent. Well, I really look forward to seeing that. And you're going to be over uh, in the UK doing some teaching uh, next year. And hopefully, uh, I'm not going to hold you to it, or maybe I will hold you to it. Uh, we'll, we'll hope to see you down here in in Hastings as well at some point in that time. So Yeah, I'm hoping to be over there. I'll be over there in September and January. And I think, yeah, I would love to come down in January and, and hang out and meet some people and continue uh, learning and teaching about the Bible. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. Thank you.